Somebody say amen. 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 I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord today. Are you? Amen. 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 I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. It would really help if I opened the correct document here. Amen. Praise God. The book of Isaiah takes its name, of course, from its writer. And Isaiah prophesied under four Judean kings, Uzzah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Isaiah prophesied from somewhere around 739 to 681 BC to a nation that had turned a deaf ear to the voice of the Lord. Friend, we live in a world today, we live in a society today that is turned away not only their ears, but I believe they have turned their back on God and the things of God. We have men and women, and I'm not here to be political, but we have men and women that are sitting in our governmental offices that can care less about prayer, that can care less about doing things according to some of many of our forefathers who writ our, wrote our Declaration of Independence and the Constitution under much prayer, friend. Our nation was built on prayer. You said, well, that doesn't matter what political party they are from. It doesn't matter who they were, what their color, race, nationality was, friend. A many, many years ago, men and women truly believed in prayer. And friend, I believe that is the only way we will make it to heaven in today's society. Is if you and I decide that we are going to pray no matter what comes my way. It doesn't matter what I am facing. Go pray. Go talk to God. Don't be on the wall. Don't be 
Amen? God did not intend for human beings to be no one another. Don't get me wrong, as entertaining as it is, that is not the purpose of human life. But Isaiah's overall theme can be summed into chapter, chapter 12 and verse 2, and it says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. If we have salvation, Sister Sue, then what are we afraid of? What do we have to be fearful of? The scripture, Brother Charles, well, never serves me right. It's been a while since I read it, but it says that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. We were created in God's image. We were created to be a people. The Bible tells us that we are peculiar. We are set apart. We're also not our own. Getting part of Bible study down a little while. But if we're not careful, we can get just like Israel and begin to basically, in my opinion, become complacent with the things that are going on. Because things are going great here in New Life, in my opinion. And I'm not here to say that things are not going great, friend. But God is moving, and I'm here to tell you today that the enemy wants to come. And I want to talk to us for a little while today on the flood that's coming. When the enemy shall come in like a flood. But it don't stop there. There's not a period there. There is a comma. And I'm not an English major. But that comma there means that you're fixing to get the answers to what was just said before that. That's pretty good, ain't it? The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against them. You say, well, who's him? Him's your enemy. Because that's a little H there. Him. Everybody say him. Yeah. Not him. But him. The meaning of Isaiah's name in itself means salvation of Yahweh. We read a lot of, of judgment in the book of Isaiah, but the, with both judgment means there's a strong need for salvation of the Lord. I believe our nation, friend, has fallen, up, fallen under a lot of things in this last year and a half. And I simply have enough faith to believe. I ain't got a whole lot of Bible for it. But I've got enough faith to believe, and just from my understanding and prayer, I believe the, the North American soil is fixing to experience a revival that we have never seen before, friend, in the apostolic churches. Oh, we got about a half a dozen of y'all. We are about to experience absolute mighty miracles, friend, in our movement, in our homes, in our jobs, in the street, in the grocery store, friend. God is absolutely fixing to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a revival that you and I have never seen before. Amen. Amen. We've read about them. I've seen videos of them. I've talked to individuals that have been there. Brother Randall can tell you of the hundreds of thousands that he's seen get the Holy Ghost with Brother Billy Cole in Africa, in Ethiopia. But I believe those hundred thousand souls, Brother Davenport, revival are about to happen here. Not only in the county that we live in and not only in the state, but in the nation that you and I live in. And to our brothers and sisters north of us in Canada. Amen? Amen. Amen. The word standard can be equal to an ensign of war, a flag or banner as a military standard used to indicate nationality. Matthew 16 and 18 talks about a spiritual foundation. Not only is that word standard there in that verse talking to us about what God can do or a representation of a wall, but I also believe that it has a representation of a standard or a foundation. For the foundation serves a purpose. You build your house on the sand, the scripture says, what the stones won't take it away. But if you build it on a rock, it's going to last. You build a house on a firm, sure, concrete foundation that is stable, it will last. And I believe if we'll, we'll, we'll live on the standard of God and the standards of God and live by them, I believe, friend, that we can have a sure and firm foundation. Amen? Amen. The word standard also can be equal to to put him to flight or to drive him away. Talking about 
Behold, the Lord's hand is not short, and it cannot save. Nor is it too heavy, or nor his ear is heavy that he cannot hear. Isaiah is letting the people know that God was in control and saw their pain. Yet we read on in verse 2, but your iniquities have separated you from God. What happened in the book of Genesis? Would that be me? When they sinned, they separated themselves from God. The very iniquity. Same thing happens again. For in sin is repetitive. I don't care who you are, where you're from, how much money you got. Sin is sin, and it works the same way in almost everybody's life. It will separate you from God. And your sins have hidden his face from you. Same thing happened to Adam and Eve. So that he will not hear, will not hear, not cannot hear. You see, their own choice to rebel brought them to this place of judgment. The problem isn't with God's power, his knowledge, or his interest. It has to do with our mind, friend, and our heart. The scripture just told us his hand's not short, his ear is not too heavy to hear. So I'm here to let somebody know today it ain't a God problem, it's a flesh problem. It ain't that God ain't hearing us. And it's not necessarily that I believe that we're not listening, Pastor. I think it's sometimes we just ain't got time for it. Come on, Brad. Oh, man, I got to cut the grass. I got to do this. I got to do that. I understand that, Pastor. Please, please share me. I understand that. Most all of us in this place, we work a full-time job. We're at work five, six days a week. Some of us work rotating shift. All of those, I understand that. But there is some place and some time that we have to spend with God. Whether it's in the morning, the afternoon, in the evening, whenever it is. Verse 3 through 8 actually lists the sins they were involved in. I'm not going to go into them. Verses 12 through 15, the people actually confess their sins to God, although he already knew it. You see, God's all known. God knows what we did wrong. God's probably known it before we do it. But it's up to us to confess our sin. You see, we see grace in action here. God himself fought for them. He fought for them when they didn't deserve it. How many of you here know that God has stood up for you when you didn't deserve it? You stood up for all you I mean, folks, I don't have to tell you again how many times I believe God has stepped in on the scene in my life long before I was married and lived in the state of New Jersey. Uh, if not, you would, I would be standing here today. That God stood up for me, that God took care of me. We can all attest to that, I believe. We just, most of us did by the lifting up of our hand, but if we were, had the time to go around the room and hear the stories of individuals of how God delivered us from all different kinds of things, drugs, alcohol, pornography, all kinds of immoral things. But the awesome thing is, you know, that they didn't deserve it. And they didn't earn it. But scripture tells us where sin abounds, grace does what? Much more abound. So that's greater. For in his righteousness is what sustained them. I'm here to encourage somebody in this house today. The righteousness of God is what has kept you where you are and what has brought you to this place in this house today, friend. You see, God robed himself in flesh following these scriptures and died on the cross so that you and I can be overcomers. We have something those people did not have, and that is the spirit of God living and moving inside of us. Friend, we cannot expect to live any way we choose and expect the blessing of God to be great in our, on our lives. So how, so he does not expect us to live in perfection, otherwise we wouldn't need the work of the cross. He does expect us to strive and to be like him and turn from our sin. You see, when we do this, God is coming into our situations and going to win over evil and unspeakable odds. 
He is victorious and we can be victorious through him. How many of you have told your kids before, you can do this and I'll help you? God is saying that to each and every one of us. You can do this with my help. Because Michaela brought it up, I don't know, yesterday, day before, I forget what was going on. Michaela says, remember that the Bible says, with, you know, with man, all things are impossible. But with God, things are possible. And I forget what we were working on. It wasn't even related to the kingdom of God, necessarily. But what she was saying that with the help of the Lord, we can get this done. Amen. So I'm here to encourage somebody in this place today. With the help of the Lord, you can overcome your situation. You can overcome what you're going through. Those circumstances are not greater than the God that is standing right in front of you. Amen. Friend, you serve a God that is able, when the scripture tells me, to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we can ask for things. And God does not promise that we'll be free from opposition or problems. But he is with us in every situation to watch over us, deliver, provide a way of escape, and give us the wisdom to know what to do and the ability and strength to do it. You see, these principles in the promise of, in the book of Isaiah, in the, or his promise in the book of Isaiah, he indicates that there would be times when the enemy would come in like a flood. How many has ever felt overwhelmed? That's kind of like, this is just kind of the situation here. An overwhelming thing taking place. The word flood suggests not just minor opposition from the adversary, but torrents of problems where our enemies swept towards us seemingly to overtake us. But there's something that we must understand. That the enemy may be coming in like a flood, almost like a tsunami. Wave after wave, getting worse and worse as each wave comes. But understand something, friends. You may feel like you are surrounded by the enemy. The enemy may be surrounding you. But we cannot forget who has surrounded us. We cannot forget that God has stood with us. And that there has been a standard that has been raised. And when the enemy comes in like the flood, friends, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard in our situation. I don't care what you're facing. It doesn't matter what you're going through, friend. I'm here to let somebody know God's about to raise a standard up in your home, in your situation, whatever's happening in the midst of your life, friend. God's about to bring you free from it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody needs to hear the Lord today. God's about to raise up a standard. He's about to raise a wall in your life and the enemy is going to run slap into it, turn around and go the other way with his tail between his legs. But I believe the only way that's going to happen is what we just discussed a few moments ago is that if we have to listen and we have to hear the voice of the Lord, we have to be with what the Lord has said, we have to be responsive yes. to the Spirit of God. Yes. What problems? Oh, excuse me, back up here. You see, in our flesh, we want to panic. We want to give up. I, I'm not that kind of individual. I don't get worked up too much. I can be lost. Driving, and that's my mother in law. I don't get worked up. I'm going to find my way out. But there are individuals that are in this room today. And, and I know you. I love you. But if things start going hairy, hairy in your life, everything falls apart. God don't want you to live that way. The scripture tells us not to worry about a thing. It don't mean we don't need to pray. That just means we don't need to worry. Worry and prayer are two different things. But at times like these, God promises that when you're in that situation and you're trembling and you don't know which way to look, Sister, Sister Kobe, we can, we, can, we can go to Isaiah chapter 59 
and verse 19 in the midst of what we're going through, we can say, by his spirit, he's going to lift up a standard against my enemies. And I believe with all of my heart, Sister Tammy, that peace can come in your life. That peace can come in your mind when you simply begin to remember or quote this verse of Scripture. Amen. What problems do you face today? Do you feel hopeless? Do you feel overwhelmed, defeated, discouraged, down, out, anxiety, depression, whatever it is? Because whatever it is, just hit the front of your brain when I brought that up. It may be a hundred things that are just almost like a sign, just digital sign just going across your mind, everything that you're going through, all the problems that you're facing, all these different things that are going on in your life. But remember that God is with you. Somebody point at yourself and say, God's with me. But not only is God with you, God's for you. Yes. Remember, friend, that he already declared the end from the beginning. His plans will be accomplished, Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. His love, he loves us, has a plan for our lives. Trust in him. Have faith that he'll bring you victory in every situation and work everything together for good. You say, well, what does this standard really have to do with? There to be in front of the, in front of you. It's there to stop the enemy, to, to turn the enemy around. You see, when God raises a standard, it means that His work at the cross has created a standard against the enemy that cannot be overcome. Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, friend, has provided salvation for humanity and a defense against the enemy. Through the death, the burial, and the resurrection, he stripped the enemy of, the, of power and authority over mankind. Friend, when you are baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins, and you are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost yes. by the evidence of speaking with other tongues, friend, the enemy no longer has authority over your life, over your family, over your situation, over your finances, over your job. Your head, friend, and in your 
your mind and your heart that God is with you, that God is before you. And if God be for you, the scripture says, who can be against you? Why? Because if the spirit of God exists in your life, friend, then he has raised a standard against the enemy. And all you've begun to do is begin to believe a lie, friend, from the enemy that says, hey, I've got you surrounded. You can't go anywhere, friend. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Somebody know that God has got you surrounded. Oh, there's got somebody that God is on your side, friend. Is God before you once again? Then who can be against you? Somebody hear me in this place. You're here today because God wants you here. And you need to stand up not only physically, but in your spirit and say, Devil, your time is up. It's over. You're no longer going to lie to me. Oh, hallelujah. And the devil can no longer cause you any trouble unless you let him in. Jesus has de defeated him. I mean, he, when he took him off that cross and he was raised, he went to hell and said, hey, buddy, give me the keys. You had your three days. Your time's up. Give them back. It's about time some of us stand up and resurrect our spiritual and physical self and say, devil, you no longer have your hands on my children, on my finances, on my marriage, on the problems in my life. Devil, no more. I'm glad there's about 60 of y'all. Not sure what we're going to do with the rest of you. We'll pray for you. Pray them through. Amen. But in order to have power, we must, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. James 4, 7. You can't have all that unless you do all of that. Did you catch that? The devil will flee from you. He'll run scared when you stand up and enforce the name of Jesus that you have the power to do so. Scripture has given us power, Brother Gavin. When we spoke with other tongues by the spoken other tongues, friend, but the fellow under the power of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, when God filled us with his power, friend, he gave us authority. Yes. And when we call on the name of Jesus, whatever we have spoken has to either come into existence or has to leave.
of God the Father, Philippians 2, 9 through 11. And you are completed in him who is the head of all principality and power, Colossians 2. Bam, baby, we got power on heaven and earth, under the earth, the things of the earth, everything. So what are you waiting on? simply means that we have not been doing what we needed to have been doing. Right? We ain't been praying right. We ain't been fasting enough. And we ain't ready to fight. Because the enemy's going to come and we're not expecting him to come. But it's in those moments, I feel, Pastor, that those unex unexpected moments that the enemy is going to come, but that if we are prepared and we have prepared for what, what is going to happen, then it doesn't matter because that doesn't have to be in the front of our mind. Because if we're doing what we need to do, God has already raised the stand. Yes. And God's in the fight with you. like you would talk to your friend. Just tell him how much you love him. Say, God, I want you to living in my life. Friend, it's not that prayer that saves you, but when God baptizes you with his spirit and you begin to speak in an unknown tongue, translations tell us, God has begun to fill you with his power. And with that power comes the Lord. But with that power comes responsibility. Those of us that didn't really have an excuse, we probably 
Like a flood. I want you to come and join us up here. 